How's it going guys, Chris here, and in today's guide I'm going to be running over all of those enemies and bosses you'll be able to find in God of War Ragnarok, checking out the different enemy types first, and then moving over to the main story bosses in the second part of the guide, just in case you want to avoid any possible spoilers. There's a hell of a lot to cover in this one, so let's get on with it. One of the first enemies you'll encounter in God of War Ragnarok is the Raider a fairly common Midgardian enemy that typically wanders around the Wildwoods looking to cause some trouble. Raiders tend to travel around in scouting parties, setting up camps that are often in your path, wrapped up in animal fur to survive the freezing cold climate, while armed with several different weapons to hunt down their prey or take on hostile forces. There's quite a few different variants of Raider, with the bog standard guys running at you brandishing makeshift melee weapons and clubs, the scouts choosing to attack over distance instead, lobbing fiery projectiles your way, and the Call Raiders who like to play with fire even more, also doing a little martyrdom trick when they die, bursting into flames to try and catch you out if you're close by. Most of the Raiders are pretty easy to take care of, though you will need to look out for the Chiefs, basically much bigger, stronger variants which attempt to club you to death with heavy swings and smashes, having a much larger weapon and a much beefier health pool to go with it. The quite aptly named Grim is a pretty ugly looking amphibian monster, a fairly weak enemy, but one that can attack and retreat quickly from combat, sometimes making their movements a bit awkward and tricky to predict. Because Grims often like to hang around with small groups, this can make them even more of a threat, using their claws to lash out in short range, hopping around the area to take turns at slashing you up. Surrounding you is generally their most effective tactic, though aside from the normal variants, you're also going to run into the Wicked Grim, a slightly tougher type which throws a few tongue attacks into the mix, along with the fatter, brightly coloured Curse Grim, which has the ability to clamber at walls and perch high up, spitting nasty poisonous blobs at you over range to dish out the damage from a safer position. Definitely something that could cause you problems, especially if you're taking on a few of these guys at once, with those projectiles leaving little corrosive puddles behind as they land, littering the place with hazardous pools that are easy to accidentally step into. Speaking of enemies that like to gang up on you, the Wretch is one of the smallest creatures you'll have to face up against, typically found in larger numbers to overwhelm you using agility. They're essentially baby grims, slippery little things that sort of look like weird demonic tadpoles, thriving in the wetlands in damp swampy climates. Being so teeny, this makes them very weak, relying on speed and their buddies to chip away at your health bar. They'll often pop out from unexpected places or from nests found within the environment, which you'll want to destroy to prevent endless waves of wretches coming after you. Though aside from the typical wretch, you'll need to be aware of exploding variants, which self-destruct after taking damage, acting as a little gas-filled bomb that you'll need to avoid. Whereas wild wretches on the other hand have a bit more strength, and can sap away your health by leeching onto you. Best to heal them before they get a chance. Once a Grim matures and has the chance to develop further, it'll transform into the Bergerer, a pretty bulky creature with slower traits to their earlier wretch and Grim forms, to a much more powerful and resistant one, with a bigger pool of health and heavier attacks to go with it. Capable of belching up nasty gases which pollute the area, the Bergerer might seem fairly slow and lumbering, but those hazardous gas clouds can complicate fights, with them acting as an area denial tool, while they attempt to pummel you with those huge arms in close range, punching out and slamming the ground, which can even cause that gas to ignite, dealing a hefty chunk of damage if you get caught within the blast radius. Bergra Mothers, on the other hand, can be arguably even more annoying variants, acting as a wretch spawn point, with multiple wretches erupting from their backs to aid them during the fight. The Bergra Mother can summon these little buggers whenever it wants, giving you lots of different things to try and dodge all at once, so it's often best to be patient and keep wiping out those pesky wretches to prevent them from becoming a problem. The Draugr are back from the last game, being hellish fiery rock people that act as a pretty basic enemy type for God of War, essentially undead warriors, soldiers and farmers who have lost their humanity, bound to the lands while being blinded by anger and the need to fight. Draugr typically roam the realms in which they died, attacking you on sight with a variety of different weapons and abilities, ranging from swords, axes and shields, to elemental fireball strikes over distance, depending on the variant. Most of the time though, you could expect to take these guys on up close in hand-to-hand -hand combat, with some able to combine their melee attacks with fire-based elemental powers. They serve as one of the game's more common standard enemy types, and you can expect to see Draugr spread throughout your journey, in several different forms with varying combat styles. In the realm of Alfheim, you're going to come across the Light Elves, which, since the last time, have become a lot more hostile towards you and anyone who approaches. They generally use fast sword attacks combined with magical abilities, 
often dual wielding weapons to give them more speed and ferocity, or equipped with larger blades for heavier strikes. The warriors are the normal hack and slash type enemies, which specialise in melee based attacks. The mystics are more prone to using magic over range, standing further back to assist their allies, and the slayer variants use more advanced combat techniques, dual wielding heavy swords while having stronger powers, acting a bit like mini bosses which are there to try and give you a tough fight. The Light Elves' strong connection to the Light of Alfheim give them the ability to create these deadly weapons, while harnessing that power to use against their opponents in battle, also letting them levitate without the need for any wings. Though probably the Light Elves' biggest threat are the Dark Elves, which were deprived of the light, hiding within the cave system underground, choosing to wage war on their light fueled counterparts and plunge their realm into darkness. I guess this is the more sinister faction of the two, despite them both being in conflict with each other and yourself. And just like with the Light Elves, you can expect them to attack using melee weapons and magical powers, hovering around the place with their large insect light wings. They might be similar to the others, but they'll use different attacks and combat manoeuvres, able to fly away and retreat when they go and get stuff, using staffs and spears to lunge at you from the air. They can blast you with energy strikes, or charge in with those weapons, with summoners having the ability to call in reinforcements during the fight, and lords being much beefier and more dangerous having tougher attacks and armour, while being able to use their own unique energy based strikes, such as magical bombs and blasts. Another pretty common pain in the arse enemy from the last game, the Nightmare returns to annoy you from the air once again. These things are essentially pesky levitating eyeballs with tentacles capable of flinging projectiles at you from a distance, all while hovering around above your head, sometimes out of the range of your melee weapons. Nightmares only have small amounts of health, but can often make battles with multiple enemies quite hazardous, being something that can catch you out while you're distracted by another. You're often best fighting fire with fire and using ranged attacks against them, like axe throws and arrows, taking them down sooner rather than later, so they don't cause too many problems in a hectic fight. There's quite a lot of different nightmare variants to quite literally keep an eye out for, including ones that explode like floating bombs, variants that shoot ice projectiles to cause freezing damage, Gloom Nightmares which can light up the screen to try and disorient you, and even a Parasite variant, they can attach to other enemies in the area and enhance their abilities. In God of War Ragnarok, you're gonna encounter Stalkers, centaur like monsters that are half human, half horse. These sort of act like mini bosses in a way, due to them having more health than your average enemy, along with a bunch of very powerful strikes that can hit you over different ranges. Stalkers are usually peaceful creatures in the lore, but have become more aggressive and unforgiving during the time period of the game, possibly due to Fimble Winter, or possibly due to Odin tampering with the natural order. The standard stalkers generally prefer to use ranged attacks, hunting you down with bows and arrows, galloping around the arena to try and escape your melee strikes. Their arrows have splash damage, allowing them to wax as mines when they hit the floor, giving you something else to watch out for as you advance forwards to take the stalker on up close. Fear stalkers on the other hand are also armed with a lance, giving them more ways to attack, plus making them even deadlier in shorter ranges, having the ability to charge at you and take you on up close more effectively than the others. Nice little tip for you, when you see those horns glowing, hit them with a ranged attack, as that's going to knock them down, giving you an opportunity to rush in and batter it senseless. Another mini boss enemy comes in the form of the Drekki, a big crocodilian beast with a jaw full of nasty teeth. These guys are surprisingly quick and agile, diving around all over the place to snap at you and avoid taking damage themselves. Not only do they resort to using a lot of hard hitting lunges, along with short range attacks like bites, tail whips and claw slashes, but they can also fire projectiles at you too, while they're hanging back further away. Drekkies are also supercharged with electrical energy, which tends to be combined with their attacks more and more as the fight progresses, creating puddles of electricity on the floor, stunning you if you wander over them, or unleashing powerful shockwaves that'll zap anything in close proximity, making the combat zone very hazardous and the fight even trickier than it already is. Not exactly the easiest fight, with the Drekki having a lot of power, speed and electrical energy to give it an edge over pretty much all ranges. The Aina Yara basically fallen warriors sent by Odin, to have another chance to die for him in battle. These undead soldiers of Midgard are devoted to their god, basically acting as expendable cannon fodder to do Odin's bidding. They're essentially another grunt type enemy, found in a pretty wide variety of different forms, ranging from simple axe, mace and sword carrying enemies, archers which use bow and arrows or slings, heavily armoured brutes which tend to punch their way through a fight, along with variants that can summon and ride beasts. One thing that separates the Arnia from the other grunt type enemies though, 
is the fact that they can use Bifrost with a lot of their attacks, which attaches to you and your health bar, detonating if you get hit by another attack, before the Bifrost effect fades away. This can potentially delete massive chunks of your health, so it's probably best to attack more cautiously when you're affected by that Bifrost. The most advanced variant of the Arniar is the Captain, armed with huge warhammers and scythes, able to soak up tons of damage while using a lot of those slow but punishing hits to smack you into oblivion. One you'll need to time your advantage right to deal lots of damage quickly, while its guards down in between those heavy attacks. Probably the toughest variant and one that's going to be a test of patience, striking and retreating whenever the opportunity arises. The Tatsu Worm is definitely up there as one of the weirder looking beasts you'll come across in God of War Ragnarok, with it essentially being a spliced up lizard fish thing with a face like a demonic saber tooth cat. These creatures have two strong arms and a long tail, which they'll use to scamper around the place while using their fangs and claws to dish out the pain. Tatsu Worms are very agile beasts that not only jump around all over the place, making them harder to hit, but they also have the ability to burrow underground and prevent taking damage and relocate their position able to slip in and out of combat on the go. Though aside from the standard ones, the curse variants are slightly stronger, having the ability to spit out streams of poisonous liquid at you over distance, which lingers around on the floor, making corrosive puddles, which you probably won't want to step into. Another pretty bizarre looking beast you'll find is the Gulon, a four-legged dog-like creature that tends to hang around in small packs to overwhelm their prey. Don't let those bright colours fill you, because these things definitely aren't friendly, darting around the place while snapping at you with that beaky jaw. Surrounding you is probably their most effective tactic, as they don't actually have all that much health individually, so they'll rely on each other to keep wearing you down while you're distracted taking on their buddies. Gulans are fairly nimble, unpredictable creatures, so you'll definitely need to keep checking over your shoulder to make sure another one isn't about to pounce on you while you're laying into another. Despite having a slightly different appearance, now having the face of an angry cat, the Cursed Gulon's got a sneaky trick up its sleeve, able to use acid to its advantage by spitting at you over distance, or by forming puddles of corrosive liquid on the floor, creating little traps, thus making the combat zone more hazardous. The Cursed variants also like to explode too when they die, so after taking one down, it's probably best not to get too close. A much bigger creature that's capable of taking you on by itself is another four-legged beast called the Greydunger. These guys hit like a bloody truck, using their huge horns to ram and gore you like a bull would, charging at you to knock you down, dealing hefty chunks of damage should they hit you. Greydungers definitely don't hold back with their attacks, choosing to be really aggressive and forceful most of the time, though despite essentially being just a massive lion creature with antlers, they're also enhanced by elemental powers, whether that be the flame variants, which can turn the arena into a raging inferno, mixing fire into their attacks to scorch everything around, definitely advisable to use your axe against these guys. Or on the flip side, there's also the Frost variants, which act similarly, though use freeze attacks, also having part of its health bar protected by ice, which can be broken with your Blades of Chaos. And then there's the Dota Greykunga, which has been subjected to Bifrost energy, which needs to be broken by Sigil Arrows or a Shield Bash, before you can take the beast on in a fair fight. While we're still on the topic of creatures, along your journey, you're also going to run into those gnarly looking wolvers from the last game violent werewolf type monsters that lash out with sharp claws and relentless slashing attacks. They're pretty lanky in stature when stood upright, they often tend to dash around on all fours to boost their speed, which can be used against you as they charge in for a quick combo strike, or run away to try and avoid getting an axe lodged in their face. They're limited to using close range attacks only, but that doesn't stop them from being very dangerous, especially as the fight goes on with them transforming into an even tougher, more vicious form when low on health lengthening their claws and attacking even more ferociously. The normal ones are bad enough, but the fierce variants are even more so, being slightly bigger and stronger and using a lot of the same attacks as the others. So the next enemy type is more of a subcategory than a specific individual, with Sadir enemies having quite a few grunt styled variants, corrupted by the overuse of Sadir magic. The most common one you'll run into is the bog standard Reaver, which are basically like raiders which have lost all humanity, due to them being influenced by the magic they use. Reavers attack with typical swords and shields like most of the other grunt enemies, though they also have the ability to heal themselves when low on health, so it's best taking them out quickly before they have a chance to get back into the fight. If you do kill one, then that magic inside them becomes unstable, blowing them up, inflicting damage on yourself if you're close by. The projectile throwing reaver variants called Shadows basically do what projectile throwing enemies do best. Stand back like a coward while tossing things in your direction. In this case, big magical bombs which can stagger you if you get hit. 
There's also a tougher Reaver variant called the Viken. Sadia Warriors armed with heavy clubs and higher health pools, which fall into the slow but powerful category. Throw more unblockable attacks and stronger lunges into the mix, while also having the ability to heal themselves too, when low on health. Aside from the Reavers, there's a few other enemies consumed by Sadia magic, with one being a supernatural entity called the Legion. Glowing humanoid creatures without any weapons, which attack using quick but relentless tactics, mindlessly dashing towards their target to mash them up in short range with their bare hands. Legions are quite fast and generally hang around in large numbers, kind of acting like aggressive zombies, surrounding their opponents to try and overwhelm them. They might have the balls to take you on in a fight up close, but they certainly don't have the strength. Being fairly weak enemies, they could be wiped out in just a few hits. With that said, they can explode upon death, causing damage to yourself if you're nearby, though can also affect other enemies too, which can sometimes work in your favour if there's a lot of them around at once. The Noken is a pretty sinister sprite creature that looks a little bit like a skinny monkey. They're not really much of a threat by themselves, though they've got the power to put a spell on other nearby enemies with magical chance, allowing them to be practically invincible, while affected by the Noken's song. Their job is to disrupt fights and give their allies a huge advantage. So for this reason, you're going to have to take out the Noken first before you can deal with the others, with the Noken typically running around trying its best to avoid getting chopped up by your axe while you chase after it. Sometimes lashing out with its claws and biting you if it feels a bit brave, also able to limit your vision to complicate fights even more. Cursed Nokens on the other hand are basically just slightly stronger variants, and both types do the same sort of thing, forcing you to track them down by looking for their magical auras and swiftly dispatch of them before they cause too many issues. Revenants in God of War are basically hunched over witches, who've traded parts of their soul for more power, eroding their humanity in the process, turning them into resentful, hostile creatures. They can be pretty awkward buggers to take on in hand-to-hand -hand combat due to their ability to phase around the combat zone, dissolving and drifting away as soon as they're about to take a hit. You need to stun them first by launching a few arrows in their direction to hold them in place, preventing them from attacking while leaving them open to your strikes up close. Revenants do have quite a lot of health, and can be tricky to fight when there's a few enemies around at once, which is what makes the Revenant Hag variant even more of a pest, able to summon those annoying nightmare creatures using magic, giving you even more things to focus on and dodge, along with the Revenant itself. Another pretty ghostly looking creature can be found in the form of the Wisp, a little ball of floating energy which has emerged from runic springs. These pesky little things can often be found in small groups, working together to try and disrupt fights and chip away at your health often by launching themselves at you, or by emitting their power which can affect you if you're close by. Wisps can surround you quite quickly, they have the ability to replicate and split in two, increasing their numbers, and being the magical entities they are, they're also protected by a spell, making them invincible to physical damage from your melee weapons. Runic arrows can disrupt this spell, leaving them open to your attacks, so you'll need to hit them with a few arrows first before you can take them out, which isn't particularly hard to do with them only having a small amount of health. Just like with the other enemies, different variants have different damage effects, with the cursed ones being poisonous, and the dodo variants applying Bifrost instead. And if you see a runic spring in the area, you'll often have to take it out first to stop the wisps from spawning from it. When three wisps converge together to unite their power, a white is born, which acts as a completely new enemy type with a lot of strength and ferocity. These malevolent creatures can be very dangerous, conjuring up powerful energy balls which can be thrown over range, also hovering around in the air to make them a little bit more awkward to hit. Some of them are capable of using electricity in their attacks to apply stun effects too, shooting lightning all over the place, which can be pretty tricky to avoid. With most of the white energy attacks being effective over range, you'll want to try and get up close and knock the creature down to stop it from lobbing those projectiles, with it not having the same protection spell as the wisps, being vulnerable to your melee strikes and weapon throws. Once you've dealt enough damage to the white, it's going to split up into the three wisps that originally formed it, allowing you to take them all down to finish that fight for good. Those elemental ancients from the last game can also be found in God of War Ragnarok, really tough magical creatures which result to a lot of powerful energy attacks. Ancients are big enemies protected by lots of strong craggy armour, only being vulnerable when they open up their chest cavity to blast out one of their energy strikes. Using ranged attacks against the Ancient's exposed core will stun the creature, allowing you to dash in to deal damage through a takedown move, kicking the living crap out of the thing while it's down. It'll often drop fragments that can be tossed back at its open chest, also dealing pretty hefty chunks of damage to the beast too. 
and so long as you're patient and keep dodging those energy beams and missiles, you'll be able to knock the Ancients' health down quite a lot, if you strike at the right moment. God of War Ragnarok is hosted two different variants of the Ancients, with one being the Forest type and the other being the Frost variant, both using very similar attacks and movesets, fully empowered by their own elemental energy, whether that be the Woodland Spiritual attacks or the Frost Ancients' Ice Infused Strikes. If you want to know what an Ancient looks like with its soul removed, cursed with the hunger to harvest the souls of other beings, then the Soul Eater fits this bio pretty well. They attack in a very similar way to the Ancients, and can be dealt with in a very similar way too, launching your weapons and its own broken off fragments towards the creature's chest cavity as it opens up for an attack, before it tries to blast you away with its energy beams and missiles to give you a nasty knock to your health bar. They essentially act like a more cool looking Ancient variant than a brand new enemy type altogether, but nevertheless, you'll still need to take on Soul Eaters over your adventure, striking that vulnerable weak spot whenever you get a good chance. So the Hellwalkers, aka God of War's version of the White Walkers from Game of Thrones, kind of fall into their own category, consisting of lots of different variants rather than being an individual being. With that said, they basically serve as frosty undead variants of already existing enemies in the game, mainly the grunt-styled enemies such as Raiders and Reavers, along with a few of the tougher types, which are often accompanied by them, like Chiefs and Revenants. Because the Hellwalkers come in many different, yet familiar forms, you'll probably already have an idea of how to take them on if you've bumped into their living counterparts already. Though despite seeming fairly similar, these Hell versions are generally more aggressive and relentless with their attacks, being fueled by rage, forcing them into a frenzy. With them having frost powers, this gives them resistance to ice attacks, including your Leviathan Axe with the Frost giving them extra protection, acting as a bit of a shield that needs to be wear down first. They also like to throw in a few of their own moves into the mix too, typically ones that are infused by ice to slow your movements. Expect fights to be a tad tougher against these guys, with them often being trickier variants to kill due to that ramped up aggression and unpredictability. Ogres are back, throwing their weight around to stomp and pummel you into the floor. They're big hulking creatures that use strength and brute force to their advantage, slapping you around the place while slamming the ground, forcing you to time your attacks right in between its own. You can expect fights to be pretty drawn out, having more health than quite a lot of other enemies, and although they'll mainly try to get up close and use their arms to knock you about, they're also prone to lobbing the old boulder at you too, to try and catch you out of the distance. They might pack a pretty mean punch, but a lot of their attacks can be fairly easy to dodge or block, with ogres being quite slow, with a lot of their attacks having long-winded charge-up times. They can still be a force to be reckoned with though, especially if there's multiple enemies around to distract you too, Though when stunned, the ogre can be weaponized by climbing onto its back, allowing you to use it as a means to batter the other enemies senseless, also while inflicting damage on the ogre itself, then you quickly kill it afterwards if the beast's already running quite low on health. One of the game's more formidable opponents comes in the form of the Traveller, a fanatical worshipper of Odin who follows a mysterious warrior's code. Armed with a huge sword while plated up with tons of heavy armor, it's safe to say that the power these guys have shouldn't be taken lightly being a particularly tough and durable enemy with loads of slow but hard-hitting attacks. They'll swing and slam that sword around, throwing in unblockable strikes that you'll need to roll out of the way of, though despite being able to hit like a truck, most of these strikes and combos can be quite easy to read and avoid, due to the Traveler's slow movements and repeating attack patterns. Aside from waving that sword around, Travelers will also occasionally hold up a magical skull to summon an explosion of energy once its power is charged up. It's a good idea to hit that skull whenever it gets whipped out, to stop that from happening of course. If standard travellers aren't bad enough, you've also got to contend with the champion variants too, equipped with a massive shield on their backs that can block incoming damage. They'll use a more defensive style as they approach you, making them more awkward to hit effectively, and with both variants having such strong armour, you can expect fights to go on quite a bit longer than normal. They act like mini-bosses in a way, but so long as you can stay patient and keep chipping away at that health, they'll be far easier to finish off once the armor has been removed by your onslaught of attacks. Speaking of mini-bosses, Trolls also act as one of the God of War's tougher opponents, just like in the last game. Vicious lumbering giants which tower over you in battle, lashing out aggressively with gigantic club-like totems. These said totems are infused with runic powers, giving the troll access to specific elemental attacks, depending on their type. And you can expect these elemental powers to be used in their respective forms during the fight, making fights even more hazardous with burn and frost effects. Aside from those powers though, trolls will typically resort to trying to smush you into the floor with that totem and their own tree trunk sized arms and legs, and being so big and strong, they can take quite a beating, having such high durability and stamina, 
using a lot of slow but potentially devastating attacks to make them fairly challenging enemies to take on. A lot of the totem swings can be parried and their stomp simply rolled out of the way of. And if you can get a good weapon combo going in between one of their heavy slams, you should be able to sap away the troll's health quite quickly. The same runic springs that create wisps are also capable of summoning something far more chaotic, providing there's a few around together to combine their power. The phantom is a supernatural magical creature that draws magic from these springs to fuel its strength, essentially being a huge mass of magical particles controlled by a rune core at its centre. Phantoms are elemental creatures, having either frost or flame infused power which they can use in their attacks, though aside from the variant you're taking on, they both act in a very similar way, with those magical powers and clumped up particles used to lash out with powerful slams and strikes, sometimes ducking underground to reposition and strike from a better angle. That core in the middle is obviously the creature's weak spot, but damaging this won't harm the creature directly, though it will eventually cause it to dematerialise, lowering shields generated around the runic springs nearby, then you destroy them which prevents the phantom from drawing any more power. Each of the magical pillars acts as a chunk of the creature's health, and when they're all smashed up, it's going to be left without any defence, letting you finish it off for good by crushing that core to dust. Job done. One creature that can be surprisingly tough despite its size, the Wyvern is a slender bird-like monster with long beak and wings, giving it the ability to glide around the battlefield and use quick relentless attacks. These can be pretty awkward enemies to be up against, due to them having several different ranged abilities, launching electrical projectiles and pulses through the air, applying shock damage which can be built up over time. Not too hard to avoid if you're taking the Wyvern on by itself, but a bit tricky to dodge if you're distracted by other enemies fighting at the same time, which more often than not, is usually the case, with these creatures sometimes being accompanied by Einhar Beast Tamers. Wyverns have a lot of mobility, able to flutter away if you get a bit too close for comfort, but attacking aggressively is usually the best way to take them on, limiting them to close quarter bites and talon slashes, which can often be much easier to counter than those electrical strikes. Some Wyverns also have the ability to infuse their attacks with Bifrost, adding a bit more peril to the fight, though generally you can expect these guys to be quite ferocious, definitely something you want to deal with sooner rather than later. One of the biggest creatures you'll bump into in God of War Ragnarok is the Drake, a massive reptilian monster with loads of sharp horns and bony spines all over its body. Drakes might be a bit rare in the game, though they're still willing to give you a proper fight when they show up, mainly throwing their weight around, trying their best to knock you down and crush you into the dirt. Being such bulky creatures with thick hides, you can expect Drakes to have quite a lot of health, not only able to dish out a lot of damage with its attacks, but also soak up a lot of damage too that you inflict on it. Thankfully, a lot of those ground pounds, bites and tail whips have pretty long wind up times, making them more predictable and easier to jump out of the way of or block with your shield. Drakes will occasionally throw in a few range attacks though just to try and catch you off guard, also charging at you like a rampaging bull to cover ground quickly and close the gap, allowing it to use those devastating close range stomps. Stunning the Drake by countering its strikes is a great way to halt its attacks, thus allowing you to dive in with a bunch of your own and if you can manage to hit the runic weak spots on the drake's legs with spears, then this is going to knock it down to the ground too, temporarily leaving it vulnerable while it's lying around on the floor unable to move. Just like the drakes, dragons are also running amok in the game causing chaos in certain realms by attacking from the air, and generally giving their realm's inhabitants a bit of a nightmare. There's quite a few different types of dragons scattered around, all with their own unique attacking styles and elemental types with some being the typical fire-breathing kind, capable of barbecuing the place with its plumes of flame, others using frost attacks to help slow down your movements, opening you up to other melee strikes easier, and others even able to summon minions to the fight, to distract you while it retreats to hit you from unexpected angles. But before you encounter the dragons in their own mini battle arenas, you'll often find them roosting around on high up perches, being a bit of a pest by hitting you with attacks as you wander through areas, which sort of act like hazards that need to be avoided. As you get into a fight with them though, you'll probably want to learn the attack patterns of each dragon type as you play, like for instance, getting ready to knock it down from the sky if it decides to fly overhead to hit you with aerial strafing runs, or get ready to destroy pillars with spears if it decides to flit up to the top of one, to rain death from above. Dragons also have weak spots on their necks that become exposed when charging up certain attacks, so if you lob a spear at that neck at the right moment, you'll be able to stun the creature, giving you a nice opportunity to go wild with those melee strikes up close. So as you wander around the Nine Realms, you'll sometimes come across gravestones, which allow you to summon a berserker warrior to appear, pitting you in an arena style fight to the death. 
These Berserkers act in a very similar way to the Valkyries from the last game, throwing you into challenging fights with some of the game's toughest opponents. There's 10 of these mini bosses in the total, all having their own ways to attack you and all out to give you a pretty hard time, especially when you try and take them on when you're really not ready. They're armed with a wide variety of powerful weapons, all having their very own combat styles with varying levels of aggression, relying on their own individual tricks to spice fights up and keep them feeling unique. Berserkers often use a lot of punishing attacks that can decimate your health bar if you're not careful, throwing unblockable strikes and status effects into the mix, forcing you to learn each warrior's moveset to have the best success at taking them down. Just remember that some Berserkers are more powerful than others, though to tackle them all, you'll definitely want to get your gear upgraded as much as possible, and grow your power level as high as you can too. You're not exactly in for an easy ride. So those are all the main enemy types you can expect to find in God of War Ragnarok, though in the next section I'm going to be running through all the game's main story bosses, which is obviously going to have a few spoilers relating to the story. So if that doesn't bother you, then you're good to stick around. The first main boss fight you're going to have is against a huge bear called Bjorn, a fairly easy encounter and one that's mainly designed to test your basic combat skills early on. You'll run into Bjorn while trying to find Atreus in the woods, after following a trail of dead raiders killed by the creature. He's going to attack you in the kind of way you'd expect a pissed off bear would attack you, swiping at you with its claws and trying to bite you in close range, sometimes slamming the floor while charging at you to cover ground quickly. Bjorn's attacks might be ferocious, but they're also quite predictable, leaving you opportunities in between its flurries to strike with melee, also letting you parry a lot of his attacks with your shield. After dealing enough damage, you'll be able to activate your Spartan Rage, letting you smack Bjorn all over the place, helping to wear down his health even more. Though eventually, after enough damage is dealt, you'll end the big bear's rampage, beating it in the fight, only for Bjorn to transform into Atreus, who's holding on to dear life from almost being punched and strangled to death by his dad. Of course, Kratos didn't know that Bjorn was actually Atreus, with the transformation happening down to Atreus not being able to control his emotions, changing his form into a big angry bear. As you venture to Jotunheim as Atreus, you'll be met by Angraboda, one of the last remaining giants of the realm. After befriending Atreus, you'll soon learn that her grandmother has been capturing animals and harvesting their souls with an enchanted cauldron. Something you're not going to let her do anymore, as you sneak into Grandma Grilla's house in an attempt to try and free a wolf and destroy said cauldron. Unfortunately for the both of you, Granny turns up not exactly thrilled with your plan to disrupt her wicked behaviour, and winds up becoming one of the game's main bosses. You'd expect having a fight with an old woman to be a bit unfair, though with Grilla being a huge giant hellbent on stopping you, this still makes her a tough opponent to take on, using that cauldron as a weapon as you dash around the kitchen trying to avoid magic and getting stomped on. You'll have to hit runes on the cauldron with arrows causing damage, sometimes knocking the giant over, allowing you to rush in and smack it with melee hits to chip away at the cauldron's health even more. Because quite a lot of Greela's attacks cover large spaces, often filling whole areas with deadly magic, you'll need to keep moving around and grapple over to higher parts of the kitchen to avoid taking damage. Eventually, she'll start covering the runes to prevent you from hitting it, so you'll need to ignite candles nearby to stun her, causing her to drop it, allowing you to destroy the cauldron for good. This won't kill Greela, of course, but it will end the fight, with her no longer being able to use it against you or the animals in the region. At one point in the story, after leaving your home in the forest, you'll be ambushed by a mysterious Valkyrie known as Vanadis, who attacks rapidly, having those wings to advance and retreat quickly during the fight switching between sword strikes and arrow shots to cover all ranges effectively. It's a pretty straightforward fight, involving a lot of quick reactions and good timing, avoiding those unblockable strikes while blocking and countering the ones you can, plus dishing out the damage in between. You'll eventually be picked up and thrown into a new area of the woods where the fight will continue, where Vanadis will start throwing in a few new moves while also throwing in poison attacks, creating hazardous areas for you to wander on through while you focus on whittling down that health bar. Unbeknownst to Kratos, the Valkyrie turns out to be Freya, still seeking revenge for her son's death, now having the opportunity to kill Kratos for his past actions. Though consumed by uncontrollable anger and the will to save his dad, Atreus transforms into his bear form, who then goes on to attack Freya, only to be stopped by Kratos, who still sees Freya as an ally, despite everything that's happened. Now conflicted by a little revenge mission, Freya decides against fighting anymore, not exactly choosing to forgive Kratos properly just yet, but letting him off for now, with him possibly being more used to her alive, able to help free her from Odin's binding magic. Not too long after, the pair of you venture off to do this, by untangling a bunch of world tree roots, binding Freya to Midgard due to that magic placed by Odin. 
though the routes happen to be guarded by a massive dimension hopping dragon called Muthug, who appears not long after to protect the routes at all costs. Part of Odin's plan to exploit the beast should anyone come along and try and lift the curse, being connected to the routes it's protecting. It's going to see you as a hostile regardless of your intentions, throwing you into an epic fight with the creature, spanning over several stages. With the beast using its huge jaws and claw lashes in close range, but also using a variety of different projectile based attacks too, slicing through the arena to hit you over distance. Getting right up to Nifold's face might seem like a bit of a dumb idea, what with its mouth being packed full of razor sharp fangs, but don't be shy as getting right up to the creature's grill gives you the best opportunity to deal the most damage with your weapons, letting you pull it out from its portal which opens up some new attacks that you'll need to watch out for. The creature infuses Bifrost with some of these attacks, adding even more reason to try and avoid them, though whenever it's about to do a tail strike you'll want to rush in and bash it with your shield, temporarily stunning Nifog, leaving it vulnerable to your melee hits. After Frey is done untangling some of the roots, she'll join the fight, able to fire arrows from range, though this is definitely where Nifog starts to turn up the heat a bit, opening portals, conjuring deadly rift energy and using every realm tearing trick it's got in the book against you even able to vacuum up nearby debris only to spew it all back at you. With Nifog being much more mobile and agitated in this stage, it's going to climb up pillars out of reach of your weapons, so in order to bring the beast crashing down you're going to need to throw your weapons at those sigils planted by Freya, bringing it down to a much more comfortable level to deal with. It's a really drawn out fight with lots of dynamic elements to it, and lots of things you're going to need to dodge, but in the end after whittling that health bar down to empty, Nifog's going to try and escape into a portal only to be held back by Kratos, with Freya closing the portal lopping off the creature's head in the process. Poor bugger probably didn't deserve it, but at least it's not going to be in your way anymore. Another gigantic pissed off creature comes in the form of Garm, which is essentially a massive hellhound chained down so it can't get into any trouble. With Atreus being Atreus, he decides it's a good idea to unshackle the beast, thinking it's the right thing to do. It wasn't the right thing to do, with Garm not long after going on a rampage and causing chaos everywhere he goes. The creature doesn't have a soul, it's able to create tears between realms, and is generally a thing that probably shouldn't be free to do what it wants, hence why it was imprisoned in the first place. After hunting Garm down a little bit later on, you'll take him on in an arena style battle in the silent clearing, and being such a big yet agile boss, you can expect the giant wolf to throw in a lot of stomps, bites and slashes using icy waves that travel on the floor to hit you over distance and slow your movements. Slashing away the beast's face when it's down on the floor is your best bet to dish out the damage throughout the fight, though you're also going to need to watch out for that chain swinging around still attached to the Garm's leg, which he'll actually use to whip down on you from above, though this can backfire, getting stuck into the floor which you can then freeze with your axe and yank Garm down to the ground, stunning the creature thus giving you a nice opportunity to give it all you've got with your melee weapons. Garm is prone to running off and jumping up to high ledges, where he'll spit ice projectiles at you over distance, only to slam back down as he dives back into the arena. Though right as the big wolf's down to his last slither of health, you'll be able to freeze his chain into place and grab a hold of it, throwing you all over the place, but eventually letting you pin Garm to a wall and snap his neck with that chain, putting an end to the mad dog's reign of terror. Ok, not exactly, as it turns out Garm isn't actually dead, he's pretty angry at you trying to kill him and he's going to hunt you down through a network of path waves, eventually leading you to another clearing, ready for round 2. In this stage, hitting those glowing weak spots with spears is what you're going to need to do, stunning Garm letting you rush in with your attacks. You can expect Garm to use a few of the same sort of strikes and lunges as before, and you're going to need to keep butchering that health bar as standard, though after sustaining a fair bit of damage, Garm can actually regenerate his health back to full, basically making him invincible due to having no soul to kill hence why he seemingly came back from the dead before. Once you manage to stun him again, you can grab a hold, allowing Atreus to jump up on top of Garm's back, who's then going to stab the big wolf in the head with his knife. This might seem pretty futile at killing the beast, but what Atreus actually did was transfer the soul of his pet wolf Fenrir into the soulless body of Garm, a trick he learned earlier from Angraboda which he tested out on a dead snake. Obviously they weren't able to kill Garm, but they were able to give him a soul, Fenrir's soul putting an end to his realm wrecking carnage, while also essentially bringing their pet wolf back from the dead too, albeit in a much bigger body than before. Heimdall is one of the main antagonists you'll come up against in your adventure, another one of Odin's sons, and a bit of a cocky smart ass who's gifted with the power of foresight, allowing him to read minds and oncoming attacks due to his powerful vision. You'll encounter Heimdall a few times over the story, 
though you'll eventually be able to put an end to his arrogance by besting him in a fight later on, after you've acquired a special spear. The god ambushes you on his trusty steed, kicking off the first phase of the battle, which plays out just like any other fights with these creatures, only with Ghoul Topper being a bit more resilient and capable of blasting Bifrost at you to make it a trickier encounter. With that said, Ghoul Topper still isn't exactly a brutal enemy to be up against, and can actually be taken care of pretty quickly, despite looking like a bit of a badass. He'll eventually come flying at you, pinning Kratos to a nearby wall, though after noticing a huge spike nearby, said spike will be used to impale the creature, heavily wounding it, thus allowing you to finish it off with your Blaze of Chaos. With his four-legged mount down, Heimdall will then take you on by himself, effortlessly able to dodge all of your attacks, mocking you as he slowly chips away at your health. The only way to actually deal damage to him is by lobbing spears and detonating them, throwing him off guard, with him unable to predict the spear's detonation. The spear is the key in this fight, as its detonation can't be foreseen, and the more you wear down Heimdall's health, the more you'll wear down his confidence and patience, making him more agitated, but also more careless, and open to making mistakes which you can then capitalise on. His attacks are fast and awkward to predict, often being combined with Bifrost, with some being used with time slowing realm shifts, which can often be used to your advantage. And once you've jabbed away enough health, you'll then go on to pin Heimdall to a wall, shoving a spear into his arm to hold him in place. Furious with Heimdall's threats towards Atreus, Kratos detonates the spear, blowing his arm to pieces. Though fueled by rage and humiliation, Heimdall constructs a new arm using Bifrost energy, letting him carry on the fight, with even more tenacity and hatred than before. This is where he's at his most dangerous, recklessly throwing everything he's got at you to try and reclaim some pride, resorting to quick charges and flurries of punches, all while being supercharged with that deadly Bifrost energy. This is going to give your reaction times a bit of a test, but by this point, Heimdall will almost completely be blinded by rage, foregoing his foresight abilities, thus letting you strike back much easier. And after depleting all of that health, you'll then go on to batter him senseless, smashing his face into the floor, only to then strangle the god to death with Kratos resorting back to his old vengeful ways, as the Ghost of Sparta is released once more. Over the course of your journey, you'll come across a few Valkyrie boss battles, a really tough one being against the Queen during the game's epilogue, the one with Freya we already looked at earlier on in this guide, and another one in the story involving both of Odin's last remaining Valkyrie servants. These servants are going to ambush you in an effort to retrieve the Mask of Creation, capture Atreus, and kill Kratos, as you venture to the Spark of the World, throwing you head first into another fast-paced fight, and one with multiple bosses to be aware of at once. The pair of Valkyries share the same health bar, and although they fight together, one will often be focused on attacking Treyos with the other battling yourself. This is a pretty ferocious fight with a lot of typical tricks you can expect from Valkyries, like wing slashes, charges and thrown projectiles, with a few new things to watch out for too, tag teaming together to hit you in unexpected ways, forcing you to pay attention to the Valkyries switching targets, which can often throw you off guard. Though aside from having to avoid deadly spin attacks and powerful dive bombs, you'll also need to watch out for Atreus getting kidnapped, interrupting their grabs by changing targets to stop him from getting nabbed. The fight gets more intense as it rages on, with the duo throwing in new moves, some of which let them fly off to deal damage from a safer distance. Though eventually, you'll be able to activate Spartan Rage, with Atreus transforming into the bear, and mash the Valkyries up while they're on their last bit of health punching and clawing your way to victory, while ending the fight in a pretty badass way. So you'll meet Thor a few times over the game, even having a little fight at the start. But the big battle between the gods happens right at the end, after you've invaded Midgard and crash landed in front of the Great Lodge. The God of Thunder wields that lightning charged hammer, viciously attacking you with all his power, being ordered to kill you by Odin, while being fueled by intense anger down to everything that's happened over the story building up to this very moment. That hammer can be used in a variety of ways, giving Thor several different attacks to cover all ranges, forcing you to be alert and ready to dodge a strike at any moment from up close or further away. Expect heavy punches, kicks and slams to be thrown into the mix too, with the fight progressing through multiple stages the more you lower down Thor's health. He generates a lot more electricity as the fight rages on, charging up his attacks to both hit you with lightning while leaving lightning fields around zapping you if you go into them. The whole area practically becomes a lightning storm, with large sections being engulfed in electricity. But while becoming more powerful and reckless, Thor's also going to give you more opportunities to inflict damage, having attacks with longer build-up times, some of which open him up to getting stunned by shield bashes. When you've dished out enough pain, you'll be able to end the fight by activating the finishing move, locking the two gods into one last showdown with those melee weapons, 
which afterwards results in you pinning Thor down to the floor and stabbing him in the hand. Although Kratos could have killed Thor there and then, he spares his life, convincing him to set aside their destructive differences for the sake of their kids. Thor stands down in agreement, and that's the end of that. Well, up until Odin shows up anyway, commanding Thor to do his bidding and kill Kratos, to which Thor opposes, standing up against the Allfather, coming to terms that he was only ever really being used by him. Odin's not exactly very happy about this, as you'd probably expect, and proves Thor right by stabbing his son through the chest, with him no longer being useful to him. Now this pretty much turns everyone against Odin, but kicks off one final showdown, continuing the fight pretty much straight after fighting Thor, but now having Atreus to fight by his side against the Allfather. Although Odin can whack you around with that staff, he tends to prefer using a more defensive strategy compared to Thor, relying on magic a lot more which can be fired out over range, as up close he becomes more vulnerable, being limited to the attacks he can use. After dodging a bunch of Bifrost Blasts while he zips around the arena, you'll eventually reach Phase 2 of the fight, slamming his weapon into the ground to create massive shockwaves, splitting the arena into three sections, forcing you to jump between the sections to avoid certain magical strikes. This adds another layer to the fight, as you'll need to keep relocating every time he chooses to light up the floor of specific sections, which will soon be followed by massive Bifrost explosions underneath. Apart from that though, you'll want to get up close as much as you can, doing what you do best by hacking the guy to pieces with your melee weapons whenever you can. Just when the fight seems to be over, Odin's going to fix you into place using magic, but fortunately for you, Freya comes to the rescue holding his old noose, which she's managed to cast a binding spell onto, choking Odin, turning the tides into your favour. Well, up until he chucks a raven at Freya to distract her, so he can blast his way into the ground to escape this. They all land in Odin's private study, where the third phase of the fight begins, but not until after Atreus destroys his precious mask of creation first, which winds the old guy up even more. Now super furious with you all, Odin unleashes the full capability of his power in one final push to wipe you all out, adding plenty of new attacks into the fray, with that staff now having a Bifrost whip added to it. Both Atreus and Freya are there to assist you this time, who are going to be needed to shoot magical orbs which hunt you down to deal damage. This next part of the fight grants Odin the ability to coat himself in elemental shields which need to be broken with certain weapons, all while trying to avoid loads of different attacks flying all over the place, from fire streams to raven clouds littering the screen with different hazards, as you try your best to keep chipping away at that health. You'll finish the fight after the three of you kick the living crap out of him, leaving Odin in a pretty broken state, unable to fight no more. Odin still refused to back down from his stubborn obsessions, so Atreus decided he's too dangerous to be left alive but rather than killing him, he casted a spell to seal Odin's soul in one of the marbles he was given earlier. While everyone decided what to do with the marble, Sindri comes along to seek revenge and obliterates the marble with his hammer, killing Odin's soul while denying him from coming back or entering the afterlife, essentially wiping him out completely. So if you're still here at this point, well done for you for having such a good attention span. It's been a pretty meaty guide, but there's been a hell of a lot to cover in this one, and if you enjoyed it, please be sure to give it a thumbs up and leave a comment for the algorithm on your way out. If you didn't enjoy it, then I really don't know how you made it this bloody long. Thanks for watching guys, stick around and subscribe for more enemy guides and other stuff in the future, and I'll be seeing you in the next one.